In developing the two-body equations of motion and finding their analytical solution for the orbital radius magnitude as shown here, we found that all of the motion of one body with respect to the other lies in a single plane that is orthogonal to the specific angular momentum direction, h hat, and h hat is itself a conserved quantity in the system. This means that we can define a useful reference frame called the parafocal frame, whose third unit direction is h hat, whose first unit direction is the direction of the eccentricity vector, the constant of integration that we found in our derivation, and whose second direction we will call q hat, which simply completes the triad of e hat, q hat, h hat, such that e hat crossed with q hat equals h hat. The parafocal frame directions are inertially fixed. E is a constant of integration. H is conserved by the physics of the problem, which means that Q is also inertially non-accelerating with respect to any inertial frame that is itself not rotating or accelerating with respect to these two bodies. However, we place the coordinate origin of this frame at the center of mass of one of these bodies. By convention, we typically put it at the center of mass of the larger of the two bodies, but of course the problem is entirely symmetric and we could just as well put it at the center of mass of the smaller of the two bodies. But we typically think of the smaller body as orbiting the larger body, even though we know that they both orbit each other. So the coordinate origin of this frame does accelerate in space, but we've already taken care of that within our differential equations. And so when thinking of the two body system, we can treat this parafocal P frame as entirely inertial. We then can write the position of one body with respect to the other, that is the radius RP rel O, in components of this parafocal frame. And because all of the motion takes place within the EQ plane, which we call the parafocal plane, we only have components in those two directions. And we will use polar coordinates, R, the scalar magnitude of the vector R, and nu, the angle between R and the eccentricity vector direction. And so we get our usual polar component form, r cosine nu in the e hat direction plus r sine nu in the q hat direction. If we differentiate this to get the velocity vector v, then we will get this expression here. And this can be simplified to this expression. To get to this result, we can differentiate the scalar r equation as derived here. Let's see how that works. So applying the quotient rule, the scalar derivative of r magnitude is h squared over mu times the eccentricity. This is the magnitude of the eccentricity vector times nu dot sine of nu over the quantity one plus e cosine nu squared. We can substitute this definition of r back into this expression and find that this all equals, that is r dot is r times nu dot times e sine nu over one plus e cosine nu. We can also look at the scalar magnitude of the specific angular momentum. And recall that this is the magnitude of r crossed with v. If we plug in our component definitions of r and v into this expression, these two equations here, and take the cross product and then take the norm of it, after a lot of algebra, we will find that we get r squared nu dot. It simplifies greatly, all the trigonometric terms go away, and h is just r squared nu dot. And this is a really important result that we'll be coming back to a few more times. And in particular, we will find the form r nu dot is equal to h over r quite useful. If we take this result and this result and plug them back, into this velocity expression, it simplifies down to just mu over h times negative sine nu in the e hat direction and e plus cosine nu in the q hat direction. So we now have a fairly complete picture of the two body system. All of the motion occurs in the parafocal plane. So the position or orbital radius vector r and the velocity vector v both lie in the eq plane for all time. That's orthogonal to the h hat direction. We have an equation that describes the magnitude of r for all time as a function of all constants and just one time varying quantity nu. We have an expression for the eccentricity vector, which we derived along the way in getting to this result. And so we can find the magnitude of the eccentricity just by taking the norm of this vector expression. And we now have 
this new relationship that allows us to write the magnitude of the specific angular momentum in terms of the magnitude of the orbital radius and the rate of change of this angle nu. In general, for different types of orbits at different locations of the orbiting body, the relationship between r and v vectors is fairly arbitrary. The angle between them can take almost any value. But there do exist special locations along the orbit where the orbital radius vector is parallel to the eccentricity vector direction. Let's take a look at those. The locations where the r vector is parallel to the e vector are called the turning points. And so we denote these with a t subscript. In these locations, we will find that r t is perpendicular to v of t. Let's prove this to ourselves. We start again with an intermediate result that we got from our two-body derivation, which looks like v cross h is equal to the gravitational parameter times the unit direction of the orbital radius vector plus the eccentricity vector. From this, we can write the eccentricity vector is equal to v cross h divided by the gravitational parameter minus the orbital radius unit vector. Recalling that h is r cross v, we have a vector triple product. And so evaluating the vector triple product and doing a bunch of simplification, we find at the end of the day that this whole expression becomes, that is, the eccentricity vector can be written as a linear combination of the orbital radius vector and the velocity vector. This makes sense because all three of these vectors, e, r, and v, lie in that same parafocal plane, in the eq plane. And so we can always get e as a linear combination of r and v, so long as r and v are not collinear, which they will not be in orbital motion. Now let's take a look at the specific case of the turning points where r is parallel to e. Everything on this side of this expression has to end up in the e direction. If r is parallel to e, then this term is already in the e direction. And so that would mean that the only way for this term to also be in the e direction is if v was also parallel to r. But we've just said that that doesn't happen in orbital motion. So the only thing that we can do with this term in this case is have it go to zero. And the only way for this term to go to zero is if its coefficient is zero. And the only way for that to happen is if r dotted into v is zero. And so what that implies is, that in the case where r is parallel to e, we have to have r perpendicular to v. And so the turning points, these locations where r is parallel to e, are special because they are the only points in an arbitrary orbit where r is guaranteed to be orthogonal to v. The turning points occur at the closest and furthest separation between the two bodies. Let's see how we get to that. We start again with this expression, and we are going to now, instead of solving for e, take this original equation and cross it on both sides with the unit direction of the specific angular momentum. Once again, on the left-hand side here, we have the vector triple cross product in the form of h cross the v cross h. We evaluate that and find So here are the results of the two dot products that we get from the vector triple cross product. h dot h is h squared over h. So this entire term simplifies to a single scalar h. And h dotted into v is 0 because h is orthogonal to v. And so this term goes away. And so this provides us with a new expression for the velocity vector of the form. Velocity is equal to gravitational parameter divided by the specific angular momentum magnitude times the quantity h hat crossed with e plus r hat. At the turning points, r is parallel to e. And so we can rewrite this for the case of the turning points as follows. Everything remains the same, except we have rewritten the eccentricity vector as its magnitude times its unit direction. And since r is parallel to e, r hat is the same as e hat. When we carry out this cross product, recalling that h hat cross with e hat gives us q hat, the second component of our parafocal frame, this simplifies to mu over h times the quantity e plus or minus 1 in the q hat direction. 
first of all, this again confirms that at the turning points, the velocity is orthogonal to the orbital radius because the q hat direction is orthogonal to the e hat direction. And we are saying that at the turning points, the orbital radius vector r is parallel to e. Second of all, the reason why we have a plus and minus here is because parallel and anti-parallel produce the same results in terms of the vector operations happening here. So whether r lies in the positive e hat direction or in the negative e hat direction, both of those cases represent turning points. And those two different cases will lead to either this magnitude being e plus one or e minus one. We get this same basic result if we instead look at the scalar equation for r, recalling that r is equal to h squared over mu over one plus e cosine of nu. As nu is the angle between the orbital radius vector and the eccentricity vector in cases where r is parallel to e, we must have that nu is equal to zero and pi and two pi and so on. And so that means that the orbital radius at these turning points is just h squared over mu over one plus e times the cosine of zero or pi, which are positive and negative one. And therefore, again, we see this e plus or minus one term here in the denominator. And if you look at this, you'll recognize that this represents the maximum and minimum possible values that this expression can take. So the turning points occur at the minimum and maximum separations of the orbit. Now, it's really important to note that not all orbits will contain both turning points. All orbits, open and closed, will contain the closest approach, but only closed orbits will also include the furthest approach. Let's return briefly to our previous derivation of this E vector expression. This also provides us a method for calculating the magnitude of E as a function of the current position and velocity of the orbiting body. We simply dot this with itself, and the result is going to be the magnitude squared of E. So let's take a look at what that looks like. This is our previous result showing that E can be written as a linear combination of R and V. If we dot these with themselves, we will get three terms, this R dotted with itself term, V dotted with itself, and then two terms that add together of R dotted in V. And that looks like And so we have this first term dotted with itself, giving us the coefficient squared with r dot r being r squared and canceling out the r squared in the denominator. And then this term dotted with itself. And so the whole coefficient squared times the norm of v squared. And finally, minus two terms of this term dotted into this term, which has this form. This can be a very convenient expression when you have the orbital radius and orbital velocity vectors. But we can also calculate the magnitude of e based on just scalar values if we do not do the triple cross product substitution, but instead directly dot this expression with itself. That looks like this. So again, we have three terms. We have this dotted with itself, giving us this term. We have this term dotted with itself, which actually just gives us magnitude r squared over magnitude r squared. And so this entire term is just one. And finally, the two terms of the, this term dotted into this term. We can now simplify this term by applying the scalar triple product because we have a vector dotted into a cross product. And so that takes the form. So that's V dotted into itself times H dotted into itself minus V dot H dotted into H dot V. But both of these terms are zero because V and H are orthogonal. And for this term, we'll take advantage of the circular permutability of the cross dot product and rewrite this as, and recognizing that R cross V is itself H, this entire product becomes scalar H squared. So let's put this all back together. We find that eccentricity squared is equal to v squared h over mu squared plus 1 minus 2h squared 
over mu r. A final note on the eccentricity vector. The eccentricity vector is actually an example of something known as the Laplace-Runge lens, or L, R, L vector. These types of vectors arise as constants in any central force problem where the central force obeys an inverse square law. In general, we can write an LRL vector A as being an inertial linear momentum crossed with an angular momentum minus m k r hat, where r hat is again a radius direction and k is a constant of proportionality. And this is for a system that obeys a force law of the form So an inverse square law in the orbital radius direction with this constant proportionality k. You compare this to our form, and you see that they are effectively equivalent. We have just moved some of these constants around and are using the specific versions of the general linear and angular momentum, which are just v and our h. Recalling that e dotted into r is e r cosine of nu. This is equal to one over mu r dotted into v cross h minus r squared over r. And we have already found that this expression is just h squared. And so we are back to our scalar expression. r times e cosine nu plus one is equal to h squared over mu. And notice that h squared over mu is a constant. In general, we can just call this L. And L has a very specific definition when you think about the system geometrically. L is the semi-parameter of a conic section. Because the scalar equation that we've been using this whole time that we found directly from the application of Newton's second law to Newton's law of gravity is a conic section solution of the form r is equal to l over one plus e cosine nu. So not only is this an incredibly useful mathematical form, but it has a very, very specific geometric interpretation, which we will investigate next.